Hello everyone, welcome to the 28th lecture in the course design and engineering of computer systems. So, in this lecture we have finally seen all the building blocks needed to design computer systems and in this lecture we will begin to understand how to do end to end application design. Okay, so, let us uh, get started. So, real world systems are built as what are called multi tier applications. You know that is you have multiple tiers or components that are distributed across several machines. Okay, you do not have everything built as just one big monolithic component on uh, one system, but it is distributed across different machines. So, for example, you know you might have uh, clients you know users of a computer system access the computer system that is hosted either you know within the organization or on some public cloud anywhere the system can be hosted. And then the first component that clients interact with are what are called front end components like you know web servers or something that receive the user's request. Then this web servers may not know how to process all types of uh, requests. So, all the logic all the business logic of an application you will not write in just this web server itself. Instead there will be multiple different application servers you know there need not be just one there could be many application servers you know each of which can handle a certain type of request a certain functionality. And these front end servers will talk to these different application servers get back the responses and send it back to the client. And these application servers also may contact there could be other databases you know which actually store application data. So, all of these uh, app servers might be talking to databases to you know store and retrieve data. So, this is these databases are typically called the back end ok. So, in this way uh, real uh, computer systems have multiple tiers or multiple layers you have a front end then you have the application servers where all the actual business logic resides then you have database servers in the back end. Of course, uh, there are many different variations on the simple characterization, but this is at a high level how real systems look like ok. So, for example, if you consider an e-commerce application you know something that we have been referring to many times in this course. Then you might have a front end a web server that displays the web page you know that you search for products that you purchase all of that could be the front end. Then there could be different application servers that are managing different functionality. For example, you could there could be one server to you know manage all the products, one server to manage your shopping cart, one server to do purchases for billing all of that all of these different functionality could be handled by different servers. And then you could have multiple databases you know one database to store the product information, one database to store the users order history or profile right. So, you have different front ends different application servers different databases all of which are working together to produce and some functionality of say you know e-commerce to the user ok. So, in the beginning we have seen what is a computer system it is a set of computers that are providing some common functionality to the user and this computer system now I hope you can visualize the internals of it. It has multiple different components that are together doing some common work for the user ok. So, the next question comes up how do you decompose these applications how do you build a system composed of these multiple components how do you design it. So, before we answer that question let us answer the why you know why do you need to build an application in a modular fashion by now I think the answer should be clear to you. It is in general easier to design develop optimize if you have many smaller components each component can be built independently can be tested independently can be optimized for performance reliability independently and then you can put all of these together that is easier than just writing you know a million lines of code in one program. Okay. So, all of us understand the benefits of modularity. The other reason is it is also easier to maintain a system you know as your system runs for many days maybe some components need some replacement upgrading something fails. All of this is easier if your system has multiple different components instead of everything in one big file ok. So, therefore, modularity is critical for large systems. Now, the question comes up how do you modularize an application I have this large system that I want to build how do I know 
which are the components, how do I split it into modules. Okay. So, I will in this uh, lecture I will try to provide some very general guidelines of course, there are many different ways of doing it, these are not hard and fast rules, but at a high level very simple ideas you can use to modularize, modularize applications I will try and describe now. Okay. So, the first thing that you have to do is identify what are the functionalities that your system should provide you know list down all the different things that you want your system to do. And to satisfy all of these functionalities you have to maintain some data you know like uh, if you want to if you are an e-commerce website you might have to maintain information about products, about users, about orders all of that you have to maintain. Then the next thing you do is identify one type of data plus all the functions that run on that data package them together and make that into one logical component. For example, the product catalog all the list of products in an e-commerce website and all the functions on that product like you know adding products, buying products, returning products whatever it is all of those functions on this data are implemented together in one component. Okay. In this way you can split your functionality into multiple components and of course again within a component also a component can be providing multiple functions right. Uh, for example, the component managing your product catalog would be providing many functions like you know adding products to it, buying products, deleting products all of that there could be multiple functions. And these different functions can further be decomposed, this component can further be decomposed into smaller components that is usually called microservices you know each bigger logical component can have smaller microservices providing different functionality. Okay, these microservices can be processes or threads or containers something. Okay, you have a bigger component in that component a functionality to add new products, to buy products, to return products, to search for products all of these different functions can be implemented as separate sub components or microservices within a bigger component and these microservices can be processes, threads whatever right. So, in this way you can hierarchically design an application you know start with the bigger functionality split it into logical components and each component you can split into sub components. And all of these components need to interact with each other via well defined interfaces or APIs. Okay. So, the purpose of modularity is you should not know how a component is implemented. So, every component will just expose a certain interface and everybody else should be able to access a component using this interface or this API. For example, the component that manages your product catalog can expose an API to add, buy, return, search products whatever it can expose an API, it can expose different functions and other components should not go and you know access this product catalog directly or mess with the code of this component in any way. You should be able to access the functionality of the component using only this API. Okay. So, that is how you design an application, identify the logical components, identify the sub components and then identify the interfaces between all of these. So, let us take a simple example of an e-commerce system to actually run through this entire process of application design you know how you go about modularizing a computer system. So, let us start with the functional requirements of an e-commerce application. So, suppose you want to build a simple e-commerce system of course, real life systems have lot of complexity. I will just consider what is the bare minimum requirements that you need to build an e-commerce system. First you need to have you know some way for users to create accounts, authenticate, login, profile information, billing information all of that has to be managed. Then every e-commerce system will have like some bunch of products in a catalog okay. and uh, you want to let suppliers or vendors add products to this catalog then you want users to be able to search for the available products using some keywords okay. and then users should be able to add whatever products that they want to buy into a shopping cart and then check out the shopping cart you know. Uh, pay the bill for all the items you know do some online payment for all the items in your shopping cart and you know provide some shipping address and have you know there are these products in your cart you bill them and you ship them. 
all of this functionality the users want to do. And of course, once you have placed an order, you might want to keep your history of your orders because you know in the future when you get a product, you may not like it, you may want to return it, okay, all of this you have to support. And of course, the other thing that a lot of uh, systems today do is they recommend, they say, oh, if you have purchased these, these, these products, maybe you might want to consider looking at this product also, you know, for their own uh, revenue stream in the future. So, such things also you may want to support, right. So, this is all the functional requirements that an e-commerce system, a very simple e-commerce system may have to support. Now, let us see how we can, you know, start modularizing this system. You know, we should group together some data and the functions of the data. For example, you can say, I will have one component for managing my product catalog and all the functions to add products from the supplier, search, buy, return, all of these functions will be handled by the product component, okay. Then you can say, I will have a user profile data, all of that is managed in another component, you know, adding users, authenticating users, all of that is taken care of by another component. Similarly, another component can be there for managing all the orders, you know, whenever somebody purchases the billing, shipping, storing the order history, all of that can be another component. In this way, you identify what is your data and what are the functions on that data and group them together into one logical component, okay. So, in this uh, slide, I have shown you one example of how you can modularize an e-commerce application. Note that this is uh, not the only way, of course, real life systems are more complex and of course, there are many different ways of modularizing. But this is just one example that makes sense. For example, you can decide to have components for the user profile, for the products, for the shopping cart, for orders and for recommendations, right. So, different components are managing different functionality. So, this user profile component might use a database to store user information, password, the your billing address, shipping address, credit card detail, this component can maintain all of this data and provide functionality like you know creating a new user account, authenticating a user, updating user info and so on. Then another pro component can manage all information related to products. It can keep a catalog of products and provide various functions to other components or to users like you know searching for products, adding products, supplier can you know here is your product component. Uh, the server that is maintaining product information, the supplier can talk to this uh, component and say add some product, then the user can search for products, can buy products and so on, right. So, this component is managing all the data pertaining to products. You can have another component that is managing the shopping cart for each user, you know the every user's shopping cart, adding items, deleting items, viewing the shopping cart and so on. You can have another component that is actually doing the ordering, the processing of an order. You know, it maintains this details of in every order, what are all the items purchased, all of that information is maintained. And this component will do things like, you know, when you want to buy something, check out your cart, it will create a new order, it will do the billing of that order, shipping, tracking. In the future, if the user wants to cancel an order, do some returns, all of this order related, purchase related information can be managed by one component. Of course, you can have, you know, a different kind of modularity. You can say one component does the billing, somebody else does the shipping, right. You can also split this into even finer granularity also. I am not saying this is the only way, but this is one example of modularity. And finally, you can have another component that is whose only job is to do recommendations. You know, look at all the orders that have happened in the past based on what the user has purchased, what other users have purchased, you can recommend products for the user to buy in the future, okay. And this can store all the recommendations and you know anybody can look up these recommendations, right. So, in this way you can take this complex functional requirements, many different requirements of a computer system and I split them into components. Each component is managing some data and doing some operations on that data. Right, that is how you can think of a computer system. So, next the question comes up, how do you store these different kinds of data in a component? So, every component is managing, you know, one or more kinds of data, then how do you store them? There are many different options here. 
For example, you have things like relational databases, you know relational database management systems. If you have taken a database course, you would have heard about these, right. These are uh, databases that store that uh, store data in the form of tables, you know you can create a table, every table will have a schema, you know uh, different columns, a fixed format, you can create tables and you can store structured data in these tables. That is the data you are storing has a certain format, you know every row has fixed number of columns and so on. And these databases also provide strong guarantees when you store the data there are certain properties called acid properties like atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability and these databases also provide transaction support that is you know you can do complex operations that span multiple tables and they will ensure that all of these operations are done very consistently and correctly. So, if you take a database course you will study about all of these in more detail about how databases work, how they store data in tables, how they uh, support querying of the data, how they provide all these acid properties, transactions all of that you will study in a database course. We will not cover that uh, here, but you should simply know that if uh, real life systems want to store such structured data with all of these consistency guarantees they can use existing database systems. But of course, you might not always want to store such structured data. Sometimes you might want to store data that does not have so much structure, okay. For that you have different types of data stores which are called no SQL data stores. This is the common name because databases usually work with SQL is the query language to query all the you know rows and extract some rows and columns in a database. So, no SQL data stores work without any structure they can work with unstructured data. For example, you might just have a key value store there is some key and there is some value corresponding to that key. It can be anything I do not know what is the structure of this value, how many columns it has, is it a table I do not care ok. This is called unstructured data given a key I will give you some blob of data that no SQL data stores can store such data. Or you might have semi structured data, you might have some structure in your data but not a whole lot like for example, you might be storing a document. It might have some structure like author name, date or something but that is all not a very rigid structure. It can have some columns but it can also not have some columns sometimes. Or you can have data stores for to store very special types of data like you know you want to store a graph you want to store something else that has specific properties. So, for all such use cases regular traditional databases are not useful therefore, you have many new no SQL systems coming up today ok. These systems they are very dynamic flexible and they do not provide any strict consistency guarantees, but they are higher performance they give better performance and they are easier to scale to larger. Uh, capacities than regular databases ok. So, you when you design a system you always have this design choice between using traditional databases that have you know fixed format fixed schema with very good consistency and other guarantees or no SQL data stores that give better performance, but lesser structure and lesser guarantees. Of course, this is a spectrum there are many choices in between, but uh, many data stores are available again with respect to you know some data stores store only in memory, but some store on disk for persistence. You know if you store only in, in memory, memory access is fast you will get back responses you can read and write faster. If you store in disk it will take longer, but with disk you will get persistence ok. So, there are many data choices available. So, if you take a database course this will become clearer as to how you design these databases and how you design this new SQL data stores. But for the purpose of this course it is enough to know that many different options are available and when you are designing a computer system based on your requirements you will pick a data store. For example, if you have to store user profile data ok this you have to store it securely it has a fixed format every user will have you know name, email, phone number billing address, shipping address there is a fixed format to the data. Such data you can store in a traditional relational database. But if you want to store a shopping cart you know you can store in a no SQL key value store you know user ID 
and a list of all the items in that shopping cart can be stored as a key and a value in a key value store. Why? Because you know with shopping carts you do not need lot of uh, consistency, it is ok if you know the values are not always consistent, it is ok if some failures happen and you know one or two items goes missing. We will study this later when we study reliability and performance, we will see why it is easier to get good performance when there is lesser structure in your data, when there are lesser consistency guarantees to be provided. Therefore, you will get better performance that is always a trade off you know you want more consistency you have to trade off some performance for it. So, for things like shopping cart it is not super important information you know it is ok if it little bit here and there happens. So, such uh, data can be stored in a no SQL uh, key value store. So, therefore, depending on your application requirements each component can make the choice of which data store to use. And also it is also possible that the data will move from one store to the other you know initially for example on some uh, video streaming website whatever the user clicks the user clicks on a video they can be temporarily stored in a no SQL data store and later on this information can be aggregated and stored in a database right. So, you have many different options and you can also move data from one kind of data store to the other. So, now that we have seen how to make components, how to store the data in components, next we will understand how to design the interfaces between components ok. So, you have your front end and you have your various application servers you know there will be many servers for many different components and each server will again have multiple databases in the back end. So, all of these components have to interact with each other your front end has to contact the application servers and these application servers also may have to talk to each other you know to exchange some information. So, for all of these purposes every component needs to have a well defined interface or API using which you will access the functionality provided by the component ok. So, the question comes up how do you design these APIs? So, there are many ways one popular way is to design APIs in the form of REST APIs. So, REST stands for representational state transfer I will explain what this means ok. So, this is a very fancy term, but the meaning is very simple what it means is simply use HTTP client server mechanism for providing APIs. So, every component it has multiple pieces of uh, data that it is maintaining. So, for every piece of data assign some URL for example, a component that is storing user data you know you create a URL user, foo, profile, the address, credit card, name, email whatever you create a URL like this for every piece of data that this component is managing. And then now once this URL is created we can use HTTP to access the data the component can handle various types of HTTP requests on the data. For example, you can say get this URL then you will be able to access the profile uh, some address of the user. If you say post you know HTTP request you can do many different things you can get you can post you can do things you can create update read delete you can do what are called CRUD operations on data using HTTP requests right. Different types of HTTP requests can be used to create, update, read, delete your uh, data that is available. So, then now what is a component doing? It is simply handling HTTP requests. The other components or front end or users are sending HTTP requests to create, read, update, delete the data and this component is responding back with HTTP responses. And the data all the data inside the component is represented by URLs ok. And of course, uh, HTTP responses and requests need not just be text you can also send complicated data structures we have seen there are standard serialization formats like JSON available using which the component can send uh, complex data also not just text ok. So, every component whatever data it has it is storing it in the form of URLs and HTTP requests and responses are uh, being processed in order to manipulate that data right. So, this is one way of designing interfaces between 
components. And the advantages of the REST interface is that you can there are many frameworks available already to send and receive HTTP data you know. These frameworks uh, were available created for web pages, but we can reuse those same frameworks and instead of sending you know web pages you can send any information about your component. You can send user data or the client can update user data by doing an HTTP POST request right. All of these can be done just that now you are not exchanging uh, web pages, but you are exchanging specific items of data stored in that component. And these responses can also be cached just like web pages. Okay. For all of these reasons it is easy to develop uh, APIs in the REST format. And of course these uh, REST APIs can be used between components and also can be used by clients. Okay. So, when clients have to communicate with front end servers they can use standard protocols or they can use REST based APIs. You can either access a web page, uh, you can either access a system using a web page using HTTP or you can also you know from your app, the, your app can be just sending these REST based API messages to access information. For example, a mapping service you can be fetching information using you are not going to a web page, but in your app you are just using these REST based APIs to access data. So, REST based APIs are very powerful as long as you can represent your data in your application in the form of these URLs and you can manipulate these data using these HTTP GET, POST, all of these requests then you can use a REST API to interact with other components in the system. But sometimes REST APIs may not be suitable in all cases. For example, you may not be able to represent all the data in your component as just URLs. You know your data can be very complex and I cannot just create like a URL hierarchy to represent all of it. And it can so happen that you cannot do all actions using only HTTP verbs. Okay. Because HTTP is fundamentally stateless, you know there is no dependence on the previous state of the data allowed and all of that. So, I will make this clear with an example. Suppose you know there is a component that is processing all the orders okay, and some user wants to cancel an order. Okay. So, this uh, uh, component has all the list of all the orders and you want to cancel an order. And you want to cancel an order only if the order has not been confirmed so far. Okay. So, this is a complicated action. How do you represent it using HTTP? It is very hard. No? So, HTTP this is not creating any uh, information, this is not reading any information, this is not deleting information. I cannot use HTTP delete request. Why? Because I do not want to delete the order. I want my order to stay in the database. The fact that I have cancelled the order, I want that information to remain, but I just want to cancel the order. Okay? I do not want the order to be shipped to me. So, this is a very complicated action. No? It does not map to just you know putting some information or reading information. This is a very complicated action. So, for such actions, it is very hard to design a REST based API. You cannot you know put this action as some URL and just do HTTP fetch or post or delete you cannot do it easily like that. Therefore, sometimes for some components for some APIs a REST based API is not suitable. In such cases what we can do is we can use RPC. Okay. Components can interact using remote procedure calls. So, this server can expose a set of functions that the other components can remotely invoke. Okay. You can remotely execute functions on another component. So, we have seen how RPC works before. So, these two endpoints, the client and server that are communicating over RPC, they will define their interface. Your interface is no longer now limited to HTTP GET, POST, HTTP request, response, no. Your interface can be anything. You can exchange whatever message you want, you can provide whatever functions you want, but you will define all of this and both endpoints will agree on this common interface definition. And then this uh, components will invoke the functions on the other side. Okay. Clients will invoke functions at the server end. So, note that client and server is simply uh, just indicating who provides this functionality and who invokes the functionality. Okay. So, the advantage here is that you can do complicated actions. You can simply have a function for cancel and invoke that cancel. You do not have to think about oh how do I do this cancel using HTTP messages, which HTTP request, which HTTP response, you do not have to think of all of that. Okay? You can define whatever functions you want. 
but that also means that you need a close coordination between your different components. You need to know what functions that the other component implements and invoke them using an RPC framework. Therefore, these RPC APIs are more useful when interacting between components of a system. If you have external facing interfaces, you know you have to talk to clients outside, it is very hard to do RPC because then the other side has to know what are all the functions. Whereas HTTP anybody you can send an HTTP request, it is a standard format, anybody can send you an HTTP request, anybody can use REST API. But with RPC a more closer coordination is needed. So this is a design choice that you have to make whether you want to go with REST based APIs or RPC based APIs. There is also a third type which is called a publish subscribe or a pub sub API. Okay. So, in REST and RPC there is a client server model that is there is one component that needs some information from another component and it is getting it from that component whether using standard HTTP request response or custom request response via RPC. But sometimes some interfaces they are not in this client server model it is not like you are asking something and getting some information back or you are posting some information and getting a confirmation back. Sometimes you just want to give some work to the other guy and forget about it. For example, you might have a server that is handling all the order information can just push this information to another server that takes care of the recommendations. You know so this order server whenever an order comes in it will just give this information to the recommendation server and there is no response needed you know this uh, guy is not waiting for any information from the recommendation server. The recommendation server will later on asynchronously process uh, this information and build its uh, recommendation for the user in the future. Similarly, when the user uploads a video to one server, this server can just give this video to another server that will convert it into various other resolutions. And this will happen asynchronously in some sense you know this uh, the first component is not waiting for a response from the other component. So such interactions are called the publish subscribe model. Okay. So one component is just uh, one or more components are just publishing some information to what is called a message broker or a task queue there are many names for such uh, uh, entities that you, you, can, you can just push information to this message broker and other people can just read information from this message broker or a task queue. Right? So, this is not a very close interaction client server model, but rather it is an asynchronous pub sub model. Okay? We have uh, seen examples, we will see more examples later on also. So, with these, uh, so these are special programs, special frameworks called message brokers or task queues. Uh, where some components can just publish information, other components can read this information and process it later on. Okay. And the subscribers, so these components that push information are called the publishers and these components that read the information are called subscribers. And these subscribers can uh, subscribe to all the information coming in a message broker or they can subscribe to specific topics only. For example, in your recommendation server there could be uh, one server that is only listening for orders on books and only doing recommendations on books. Another server is only doing recommendations on electronic items. In this way you can just get information only about specific orders or specific topics. right? And these message brokers what they will do is whenever one component publishes message they will temporarily store the message until other subscriber components. Uh, subscribe or receive retrieve that message later on. And of course, these message brokers uh, will also provide some high performance reliable message delivery you know many publishers should be able to push messages quickly, many subscribers should be able to read messages quickly. And these publish uh, subs, uh, publishers and the broker, the broker and the subscribers will again be using maybe something like sockets, TCP to reliably exchange messages all of that will be there. So, what you are doing is you are basically adding an intermediary between two components instead of two components directly interacting with each other in a client server manner you are putting an intermediary so that one component can just push information the other can read the information later on. 
So, where the interaction between components does not have to be synchronous and it is asynchronous these pub sub kind of APIs can be used and there are many frameworks available today to help you build these pub sub APIs. There are many message brokers or task queue software available to you where using which you can have this kind of an asynchronous interaction between components. So, that is all I have for this lecture. In this lecture I have given you some brief guidelines and an introduction of how you do end to end system design. So, we have considered the example of a simple e-commerce uh, system and we have seen you know how is this com complicated system built as smaller components, how does each component store data, how do you design the APIs interfaces between these uh, components. So, all of this we have seen the very basic level of information about system design. So, I request you all to think about uh, systems uh, yourself and you know try to think about what are the requirements, how do you modularize, what kind of data stores, what kind of APIs, all of these things that we have discussed in today's lecture. I request you to pick another example other than e-commerce and do it on your own. So, in the next lecture we will also run through more examples. What we will do is we will apply all of these concepts and do an end to end design of many different kinds of computer systems in the next lecture. So, that is all I have for now. Thank you.